So welcome back. And today we are just moving on to the fourth chapter of the Gita. And uh, here we will introduce a new concept of the concept of revelation of knowledge coming from a transcendental source. So the subject being this, this is based on Bhagavad Gita. The topic is what is revelation? Is it for real? And we'll discuss four, one and two in the Gita. So imam vivasvate yogam proktavan hamavyayam vivasvan manave praha manurikshvaka ve bravit. A Krishna is telling here that this knowledge was given by me to the sun god long ago and then he passed it on to uh, others imam vivasvate yogam and in that way that knowledge kept coming down so the idea is primarily this knowledge is is co-eternal with creation so beyond the specifics of the origin the principle is right from the beginning from the dawn of creation, this knowledge has been there. And we will talk this session in three parts. If you have a look at the PowerPoint, the need for spiritual knowledge or ultimate knowledge, then the nature of revealed knowledge, and then the nature of the recipient of the revealed knowledge. And each of these themes we will elaborate further in future sessions. Now to link this to what we have spoken earlier, primarily the way the Gita's thought flow is going. Is that we focus primarily on the basic question of the Gita, which is what is Dharma? What is the right thing to do to understand what is the right thing to do? We look at one's identity as the soul, not the body. And thereafter, look at the implications of that in terms of various issues like the loss of a loved one, like the view of the plant and animal world. Then we look at how we act with detachment, understanding the concept of destiny. Then we look at the concept of sacrifice and contributing to a larger whole. Then in the last session talk about self-destructive desire and how that can be overcome. So now toward the end of this chapter, so basically this was the flow of our thought. The Gita's flow is its, has its own flow. The Gita's flow is basically in the first chapter, Arjuna asks questions, basically gives his reasoning why he feels he should not fight. In the second session, Krishna, basically in the second session, um, uh, second chapter, Arjun, Krishna tells, introduce the concept of soul and how to act with detachment. Arjuna is a little confused about how is such an actual detachment possible when he has to fight in a war. And for that purpose, Krishna introduces the concepts, higher concepts of how sacrifice is to be done. And when we work in a mood of sacrifice, that includes various modes of action, various kinds of activities are included within sacrifice. And then now the now this knowledge which Krishna is talking about at the end of the third chapter, he says this is the knowledge by which we will be able to control our self-destructive desires, and then, then we'll move toward on a positive side, move towards self-realization. And this knowledge is what Krishna says, I have given long time ago, and now I'm repeating it to you. So the idea is <clears throat> after giving a brief understanding of the knowledge and the purpose of the knowledge. Krishna now talks about the origin of that knowledge and the origin in terms of the principle we will look at today and then we'll move forward to other things. So need for knowledge is a fundamental need in the human world. So if we consider, if somewhere to say, someone were to send us a complicated gift, a, complica a complicated machine as a gift, then we would wonder what is its purpose? Why has this been sent to me? Who has given it? And if some, if, if we see the clearly it's a complex machine, then the question would come up, surely the giver must have had some purpose, otherwise they would not send it. And if they, they wanted me to use it and put it to proper use, then surely the purpose would be told. 
so similarly for us we can consider that when we function in life how do we go about uh, the whole universe is like a, a gift to us gift to us in the sense that the universe has many many things that we need for our survival we need water we need air we need light we need heat and all these are provided within the universe we often work to get say our food but even the basic food is provided in nature we only work to procure it our effort is secondary like the birds every morning chirping and searching for grains the birds chirping and searching doesn't produce the grains it just helps they just search to locate it similarly our efforts are secondary so basically for our existence a lot is already provided in nature and that is provided who has provided it and if they have provided it wouldn't they provide some kind of knowledge for us by which we would be able to know what is to be done and how it is to be done so just like a device if it were given to us and we knew how to use it how best to use it then we could put it to the best use the universe itself is like uh is like a gift to us now we may say but now there can be different visions and different versions of the idea of how the universe works but the common principle underlying all this would be that essentially each one of us has some things we need for functioning effectively now in our life there are means and there are purposes so if somebody gave us a car and then obviously would want to know okay i've been given this car is it somebody wants me to go somewhere with this car where do they want me to go so if there is means there has to be purpose also so we have the resources to live with that are given to us to some to a significant extent so if what we live with is provided for surely what we are meant to live for will also be provided in some way or the other now what specific way and to what specific degree that can vary but right now we are looking at the principle of revelation revelation essentially means revealed knowledge so the idea that there is some knowledge which comes from a higher non material source and that can help that can guide us in our life so that is the idea of the basic idea underlying revelation just as a car would come with a manual unknown machine would come with some kind of manual so the bhagavad gita the spiritual knowledge the given therein is like a guide book for living so when we have this basic understanding of the principle underlying revelation now the next point that comes up is okay how, what exactly is the nature of this knowledge that is it a set of facts just um, the point of when we live in the world in for living in the world the world is a complicated place and what we need essentially is a, is a set of guidelines by which we can live so the spiritual knowledge is primarily it nature of knowledge is primarily in not informational but transformational so how do we now we we would consider okay i accept the principle that there can be some kind of uh, revealed knowledge but that maybe that maybe there is something which is a manual but how do i know what is, which is a manual so basically if we consider the idea of a manual what does a manual do the manual essentially enables us if i have a device the manual helps me to make sense of the device and help me to put the device to better use so if i have a particular complicated machine and then i look at a picture and okay this button here does this and i see this press the button actually it does that and i press that button and do does that so then how oh, this is interesting 
this helps me to make better sense of things and then if i start doing things with it as per the guideline of the manual if it helps me to function better and that's even that's that's even more persuasive so similarly now right now when we are discussing about the principle of revolution there are two approaches to it one is the approach of reason and logic the other is the approach of faith so these two are not contradictory and how they reconcile that is also going to be a full session later but at this stage we are we are just trying to create some open mindedness toward the idea of revelation that okay the principle there could be revelation there could be the nature there could be some spiritual knowledge which could be used by us some kind of revealed knowledge can act as a manual now we are discussing the question okay how do i know what is that knowledge what is that or rather which knowledge which what can be considered to be a manual so now within this there if some device is very complicated say now for example now if you are using a computer a laptop there could be there could be windows there could be mac or linux or whatever then now we might get a manual but most of us when we operate we hardly use a manual whenever we have any issues we go on google and search and on google there can be many different websites there can be dozens and dozens of websites which can offer solutions to one particular problem and now all of them are addressing more or less the same problem and some of them may give you the exact same measures to fix the problem some of them give you slightly different measures the idea is the purpose is one and this is similarly so just as there can be many websites which can help us better use a use our laptops or fix some minor things in the laptop so similarly there can be multiple manuals so this the concept of the manual uh, opens us to the idea of religious diversity and that we will be talking in a later session but here let's focus on the idea of revelation and let's look at the bhagavad gita as a possible candidate as a possible sample for revealed knowledge for being a manual of life manual for living so now does the gita's wisdom just like i said earlier how could we surmise or infer reasonably that a particular book is a manual by two things it helps us make better sense of the device and it helps us better use the device so similarly if studying the gita helps us to make better sense of life and it helps us to live better now be make better sense of life means what that in life there are questions you know, such as why do we why are we existing at all and if we are existing then why are why is there so much inequity in the world why are some people born wealthy some people born poor why do sometimes bad things happen to good people why do we sometimes get the results of our work sometimes we don't get the results so all these questions the bhagavad gita offers a philosophy that provides reasonable answers to these questions so if we understand the wisdom of the gita we'll find that it helps us make better sense of the world and more importantly if we start uh, living more spiritually with the understanding that our core identity is that we are souls then uh, that spiritual foundation for our life will make us calmer will make us uh, more happier will make us stabler will bring more meaning and purpose and fulfillment to our lives so now this is something which has to be experienced but these are the two broad ideas with which we can understand that if the bhagavad gita were a manual then how would we know it is it simply a matter of faith because we are born in a particular tradition or we like a particular tradition then is it that we accept that, that that tradition's book is a manual no we are looking at it from a rational perspective and we say that yes if this is these two results come up better understanding and better application then that's that's good then that could be a possible candidate for revelation now the bhagavad gita itself describes a way in which revealed knowledge is transmitted so we are talking about three things i talked about the need of 
revelation revealed knowledge then i talked about the nature of revealed knowledge the nature of revealed knowledge is primarily it is not just a set of facts it's not just informational it's meant to be transformational now facts are sometimes important but the key is is whether it changes the way we align with the world it changes the way we look at the world and function in the world in a way that our visions and actions become more productive more, more fulfilling so when we study if we study the bhagavad gita itself we will look at it at the end at the end of the gita it is not that arjuna has to give in some multiple choice exam or for that matter he has to give a essay or essay writing contest or essay, essay exam it is he has to choose his actions and the end of the gita is that he he at the start of the gita he is confused and by the end of the gita he is illumined he is confident and so the gita's knowledge itself is not so much of facts krishna doesn't ask arjuna do you remember this verse uh, that's not the point the point is whether he has uh, whether that all the knowledge that is given has led to a clearer understanding and thereby a transformation from confusion to confidence to determination so that's what happened to arjuna so similarly when we face the complexity of life it can seem sometimes pointless it can seem arbitrary and can be very confusing but if we learn to be guided by the gita's wisdom then we can move from confusion to determination to confidence so it is it is a transformation of the heart and transformation of the heart transformation is not just a intellectual transformation so it is actually a, a re reorientation of the heart that means that when we talk about receiving spiritual knowledge it, it the result is a uh, a whole hearted it's not just a dry intellectual agreement on some issue yeah what you say makes sense that might be the beginning but it's a realignment of our whole life evam parampara praptam imam rajarishayo vidhu so krishna says in this way through a tradition this knowledge was received so this is slide 17 that evam parampara praptam so now what exactly is parampara the idea of a tradition essentially again is that each one of us we have a past we were born in a particular dynasty a particular family and just like in any family if in a particular generation uh, the family has acquired a lot of wealth then they carefully pass on maybe write a will and pass that wealth on as an inheritance to the next generation so just as material wealth is passed on carefully similarly spiritual wealth uh, the wealth of knowledge of life's purpose and meaning that is also passed down now how exactly is it passed down it is through parampara parampara basically means tradition or you could use the word disciplic succession so so there is a spiritual master a guru the guru teaches the disciple and the disciple becomes mature the disciple also becomes a guru and then the then the, the guru teaches to their disciple and in that way it goes on now why this particular chain because the idea is this knowledge has to be lived it is not just to be uh, taught it is not just to be mem not just to be memorized and through the guru disciple relationship the idea is that the guru trains the disciple and then decide now what is the training what is the training in the training is not just in a specific uh, language to speak or a specific a uh, way of dressing or a specific performance of rituals these may all be parts of it but the essential is for what purpose to live and how to pursue that purpose so the 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 spiritual knowledge is as i said the manual for living and the world does not need people with answers as much as people who are the answers people with answers means the people who who any problem they can just say do this do this do this do this 
Yes. Now, if there are complex issues and some people are expert enough to come up with solutions to complex issues, that's good. But people with answers uh, can very easily become at one slide arrogant thinking, I know everything. I know the solution to every problem. And more importantly, if they become arrogant, then they are not living the spiritual principles of, of devotion. And then they are themselves not the answer. People who claim to be the answers are often parts of the problem, not the solution. So actually, we, we need people who, who don't just claim to have the answers or who have the answers, but people who are the answers. People who are the answers means, again, we're not talking about somebody who is a savior who will come and in one day fix everyone's problems. But they demonstrate, they are the answers in the sense that they demonstrate how to live spiritually, how to live with a spiritual purpose in the material world. And by their example, this knowledge moves on. Now, it's interesting, Krishna talks about the parampara here of Rajarishis, of kings. So, this is 4.2. We are discussing 4.1, 4.2. 4.3 also we'll discuss a little bit. Evam parampara praptam imam rajarisha yovidhu. So rajarishi, uh, it's a compound word. Raja means king, rishi means sage. So we could say these are royal sages or saintly kings. So the idea is that a sage is one who is who has controlled the inner world and who has actually gain spiritual vision so the sage is an inner seer the king is the outer ruler so the royal sages or the saintly kings are both inner seers and outer rulers that means they, they are inspired and guided by a spiritual vision and then they also have the material power to administer and to rule so this, this is a tradition of kings of saintly kings that means that this knowledge is of living is demonstrated not just through some sages who have renounced the world, but it's demonstrated through great kings who were in the in the center of the world. Kings have to, if they are if they're responsible and not just power hungry, the kings have to take responsibility for the administration of the unit of the kingdom. So they are in the they are dealing with the world practically. And they, when they demonstrate the spiritual knowledge, they demonstrate living according to spiritual knowledge, it inspires others also. So people who are the answers. So the disciplic succession is the idea that there are people when they live according to spiritual principles, they, they mold their life according to the manual, then they demonstrate these answers. And the demonstration inspires others, that elevates others. So that's the idea. It's, it's a disciplic succession. And there can be many disciplic successions. There are, this is a particular disciplic succession of kings. There are, uh, there are in the, <clears throat> in the Padma Puran, four, four disciplic successions I mentioned. The idea is that, Wherever there is a teacher who has learned these principles and the teacher passes down that particular knowledge, then there is a disciplic succession over there. The, the principle is that this is a knowledge which has to be lived and that's why it's best learned from someone else who has lived that knowledge. And that way that knowledge gets transmitted in its integrity. Now, does that mean that anybody else can't understand it is it that anybody outside a disciplic succession is not having that knowledge suppose somebody studies the Gita and then writes a commentary on the Gita or somebody may not be connected with the tradition but they're deeply devoted dedicated themselves to study spiritual wisdom like the Gita well they can definitely have knowledge uh, and when Krishna is talking about the parampara the prince is saying this is the way the knowledge has been transmitted. And let's consider the idea of if we consider this knowledge to be like a medical, medical knowledge. 
So the topic I'm discussing is the nature of rebuild knowledge. <clears throat> the, so the idea is that if if we want to if it's considered medical knowledge now in every home there might be the grandmother who has some home remedies for common ailments now those home remedies work and we don't have to deny or disprove them just because the grandmother doesn't have a medical degree it's not that they they have to be rejected but the idea is that if somebody wants to get a medical degree then then learning from their grandmother would not be the soundest idea generally the idea is we go to uh, say if, if it's in india the medical council of india this is a pre existing panel of doctors who will certify whether a particular student has become a, a proper they train the, they train educate and train the student and then that then student becomes certified as a proper doctor so spiritual knowledge in terms of some uh, some useful or even valuable spiritual insights may be available in many places and wherever just like if, if we are sick and we get some treatment get some medicine which works that's good so this the another word for this parampara a parampara is another word not exactly synonymous is sampradaya parampara basically like refers to one chain but you can have multiple chains just like say one spiritual master might have multiple disciples and then the disciples may have multiple disciples and that way it expands so it's like a pyramid starting from god moving downward 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 expanding so now the whole set of ch disciples chains that are going on going down they are called sampradaya and the word sampradaya also has another meaning in, in sanskrit prada prada is to give some is completely sampradaya means that which gives complete knowledge that which is systematic extensive comprehensive knowledge so oh, the <clears throat> the idea is that spiritual knowledge can be uh, assimilated just like we need to to get medical knowledge we need to go to a medical university and get a proper degree Uh, then we can we can be certified medical practitioners medical knowledge may be available outside the medical uh, the degree certification provided by the medical degree also but but for it to be systematic for it to be comprehensive for it to be uh, for it to be such that one can learn and teach in a systematic way it's we get it from the uh, we need to be certified as medical doctors so same principle applies to spiritual knowledge also Now there can uh, about other religions and other traditions. Uh, I will talk about in four eleven when we come to that. But this is the principle of revelation, and what we are discussing right now is in the Bhagavad Gita. The, the principle of revelation is God gives will give us knowledge about how to live, and what is the nature of revelation, and how it is transmitted, as described in the Bhagavad Gita. How that is that is what we are discussing over here. Bhagavad Gita has its own system which it describes of checks and balances to min to maintain the integrity of the knowledge, and that system of checks and balances is that that it is transmitted in disciplic succession. Now Krishna says, even when it is being transmitted in disciplic succession, sometimes it might get lost. So, so that that is the third verse. Sakale ne hamata yogo nashta parantapa. Second verse says. Second verse gives the mode by which it is transmitted, and it also says that there are ways in which there are times when it may get lost, and then he says, "Therefore, I am going to give this knowledge again." So it's if we consider it to be like a water supply. So when the water comes down from the sky, it is it is clean. It is pure, but then it falls on the earth. It mixes with the earth. and the further it goes from the source the further down it goes the further it's likely to be mixed with sedimentation more likely it is to become dirty so similarly krishna says that sakale ne hamata by the great power of time mahata uh, this knowledge yogo nashta paranta pa this now is use the word yoga and nashta nashta means destroy now yoga what does yoga refer to this knowledge 
is meant to establish a connection and the knowledge itself is not destroyed but the connection that was to be established through the knowledge can get destroyed and when that connection gets destroyed then it has to be established so now what is that connection that will be discussed further in due course but as the essence of the connection is the connection between the soul and the supreme the the bond between the between the finite soul and the infinite soul between us and the divine that is the bond that this knowledge is meant to establish ultimately but when that knowledge bond is broken krishna says i myself different and now i reveal this knowledge to you so so eva yam maya tedya yoga prokta puratanaha is 4 3 he says that same knowledge now i am sharing with you yoga prokta puratanaha that ancient knowledge now i am giving to you so now if we move on <clears throat> if it, this reveal knowledge is passed down through scripture I, again one point make is that is reveal knowledge the study of scripture now we may say there is so much scientific knowledge in the world is do we need anything like spiritual knowledge as yes, this is a big subject but basically what we have is science is the study of matter and spirituality is the study of what matters what is it that truly important in life how do we prioritize what is it that we want ultimately live for that's what spirituality tells us so the idea is spiritual knowledge doesn't have to be a competitor to scientific knowledge we can have scientific knowledge about computers and planes and um, internet and we can use it but for what purpose do we use it so there is knowledge of matter and there is knowledge of what matters if you say uh, it is a guide book for living now guide book for living doesn't mean that say it has to tell us it can tell us but the guide book for living means ultimately what is the purpose of living and how to pursue that ultimate purpose that is the primary knowledge that we are looking for see our krishna does not learn our krishna does not in the bhagavad gita teach arjuna archery that arjuna already knows archery krishna does not teach arjuna sanskrit language there is arjuna is already a well educated person and he is educated in various areas of knowledge what krishna in the bhagavad gita gives him is a framework for making uh, making sound decisions with the light of knowledge so krishna so krishna does uh, so the bhagavad gita's knowledge is not a competitor to the knowledge of archery that drona had taught arjuna so that is a, that is a operational skill very important i am not minimizing it by calling it operational skill but it is how to function in the world with doing specific specific particular activities that is operational skill and that is something which arjuna had learned from other sources and similarly for functioning in the world we may use for doing specific tasks we use specific forms of specific knowledges that is perfectly fine uh, but what is this? we may have we may learn engineering we may learn medicine we may learn law the specific forms of knowledge for doing specific things in the world so what we do in our life is not the same as what we do with our life in our life we need to do many things and that is something which we learn uh, from various sources arjuna learned archery from his teachers so science is something we learn for do is the knowledge that we learn for doing some things in this world but so what we do in life and what we do with life what is it that we are ultimately pursuing in our life they are two different they are two different things and in that sense they, they, it need not be competitors and the last part we'll discuss now what is the nature of spiritual knowledge so what is the nature of the recipient of that spiritual knowledge so now the recipient has to basically have krishna says that he says sa eva yam maya tedya yoga prokta puratanah bhakto sime sakha cheti rahasyam hi etad uttamam bhakto sime sakha cheti he says i am 
bhakto asi me so that i you are my devotee and therefore i am giving this knowledge to you so krishna is saying that it's a matter of the receptivity of the heart the devotional tuning of the heart that enables us to understand this knowledge so <clears throat> the qualification for gaining this knowledge is not just uh, some high level of iq or some special knowledge of some esoteric language uh, question, the the question is that it is the it is the idea of the receptivity of the heart by the presence of devotion within him that enables arjuna to receive this knowledge so now what does it mean just like if we have a we have a phone or a particular device we use that for functioning and to the extent we use that for functioning to that extent we learn so just as any particular device needs to be tuned just like a, if a phone is in the tuning zone it has a receptivity receptivity then it can we can use it if you are having a tv or a radio if it's it has to have receptivity then it is um then it is uh, then it can receive that knowledge so now devotion here is not just sentiment oh maybe there is a god i care for god i love god that's good it's not just sentimental longing sentiments may come and go but it is spiritual receptivity it is a training and tuning of the heart by which it is receptive so sometimes we may feel feel devotion coming in our heart and that is good when such feelings come but they alone don't mean that we have become spiritual they simply mean that we have learned that we have got some experiences <clears throat> now so this nature so now when you talk about the devotion what, what does it mean actually that actually it begins with faith what is the relationship between faith and devotion as i said if we consider devotion simply to be an emotion of the heart sometimes it comes and sometimes it goes but if we are considering devotion as the tuning of the heart to be spiritually receptive it's basically uh, that means our heart is enriched with loving trust and how does that come that is the beginning is faith just like when we go to a teacher go to a doctor wherever we go we start with a certain level of knowledge and then we increase that we start with a certain level of knowledge is this doctor basically is a person a qualified doctor or this teacher know this know what they were trying to teach or their stuff and once we see that they know it then we move forward so in any journey say if we are driving if we are to drive effectively we need brakes we need brakes in case you start going off track and we need an accelerator so that we can go faster if you are on the right track and the road is clear similarly for us if we want to go on a spiritual journey uh, we also need the brakes and the accelerator so the brake is doubt the accelerator is faith so we also need to be able to think carefully is the does this make sense as i said at the right at the beginning itself that how do we know whether something is a manual that is through through whether it makes sense the manual should help us make sense of the device and it should help us use the device better work with the better with the device so that brings us to the last part when we put in faith there is reasonable faith and there is blind faith so reasonable faith is basically it has two characteristics blind faith is just whatever we feel like believing we believe it whatever it be there is no consist, no not much use of the intelligence in that but reasonable faith is it is sensible and it is verifiable that before putting the faith we we use our intelligence to evaluate whether things make sense or not just like if we go to a doctor and if the doctor a diagnosis us say we have stomach pain and the doctor says we have to amputate your leg say what that doesn't make sense to me so we would be suspicious if the doctor's diagnosis made no sense at all to us and that mean it is good to be have that doubt so whenever we are 
is seeking spiritual knowledge first thing is we need to see whether it makes sense vimrishaita dasheshena yathechati tatha kuru vimrishaita dasheshena deliberate deeply krishna tells arjuna at the end of the bhagavad gita 1863 he says uh, krishna doesn't just demand obedience krishna asks for contemplation and then based on contemplation he asks that we take a responsible decision and then after that yeah, uh, so there's reasonable faith reasonable faith as one can say sensible and then there is verifiable verifiable means that if we go to a doctor because we have uh, we have stomach pain and doctor says okay you take this medication for 3 days and you'll feel better let me check after 3 days do we feel better or not uh, so similarly if we are going on the spiritual path if following a particular path living a molding our life on a particular knowledge so what should happen by that broad this the broadly this is this will discuss the subject much more but broadly the material is characterized by constant change the spiritual is characterized by steadiness by stability so the more we are attached to the changing the more we are insecure the more we are vulnerable the more we are fearful the more we keep craving for things which are there for some time and then go away after some time in contrast if we are we are attached to the spiritual that we become stable we become calm we become more composed so we start feeling more joyful because the spiritual is also the level of it the spirit the soul one of its characters is ananda it's joy the level of spiritual reality is characterized by joy so broadly speaking what we need if we are on the spiritual journey on the right path one thing will happen is that our attachment to the material with its constant changes and the insecurity and the craving that results from it that will decrease and our attachment to the spiritual will increase will feel more content internally will feel more composed amid life ups and downs and we'll find ourselves moving purposefully in a direction in our life which is more meaningful more fulfilling so basically detachment from detachment from the world's constant changes which cause insecurity or which create craving within us and attachment to the unchanging uh, spiritual reality those are broadly we can say characteristics so if this is happening then we can say that we are on a spiritual journey which is progressive which is purposeful so this is the characteristic of reasonable faith and we see this two things happen to arjuna krishna asks him to think deeply and arjuna thinks and then when he acts he will he acts confidently not just confidently he acts victoriously the end of the gita says that arjuna will become victorious that's a prophecy and that prophecy does come true so i'll summarize what i spoke today i spoke on the theme of what is revelation is it for real and i talked about three top three topics in this the need for revealed knowledge so revelation means that we are provided if somebody provided us a expensive gadget or a machine we would wonder what is its purpose they would surely give some kind of manual for how to use it or what what is to be done with it basically the universe provides us all our basic necessities for living and then if if the needs for living are provided for the purpose of living will also be provided for won't it so that purpose is given through spiritual knowledge and that spiritual knowledge or that is what that is scripture basically so the there can just as for a device there can be multiple manuals which broadly guide so similarly there can be different traditions but there is the bhagavad gita offers a particular is a part of a particular tradition which offers revelation and then we talked about the nature of revealed knowledge that it is primary it is not so much informational as transformational the idea is how do we know a particular book is a manual whether it makes a help whether it may helps us make better sense of the device and whether we can work better with that device so similarly 
if a particular book is a candidate for being a manual then it has to with it we can better answer life's fundamental questions and we can better face and emerge stronger through life's ups and downs and then within the bhagavad gita's tradition the knowledge is passed down through parampara so krishna describes here in the gita a uh, a parampara a tradition a disciplic succession of kings which indicate that this knowledge was not just meant for those in the renowned order but those in the heat of life also in the middle of the in the buzz of the world and then <clears throat> the i different people just as in a home a grandmother can have some basic home remedies but the grandmother doesn't normally give a medical degree to someone so people there many people can have spiritual insights but sampradaya the chain the the whole chain the whole system of multiple chains descending from a divine source that's called a sampradaya and that uses knowledge incomplete incompleteness fully and then <clears throat> we talked about how do, what is the qualification for somebody to receive that knowledge there is basically krishna says devotion it's not just uh, uh, not just intellectual capacity but the devotional receptivity of the heart and that comes through training the heart the training is begins with faith and on the spiritual journey doubt is like the brake faith is like the accelerator and with respect to blind faith we need to press the brake with respect to reasonable faith we need to press the accelerator and reasonable faith means it is sensible and verifiable that it helps us make better sense of life when we study the gita as a manual and living according to its principles helps uh, produces the desired effect that is we if we are spiritual beings are meant to live for a spiritual purpose then we become less shaken by the world's ups and downs world's pleasures and troubles and we become more stable and enriched at the spiritual level so i'll take a few questions that are here and talk about there is always now I, regarding other religions i mentioned i'll talk in the future session regarding guru we'll be talking about that in 434 which is one of the later verses which talks specifically about the guru so in transmission inevitably some knowledge gets lost so can the same thing happen with respect to the tradition yes it's possible and again we have to understand what does transmission mean over here this is not just a literal repetition this is it's not like a game of chinese whispers where uh, you one person whispers something in second person's ear and then by the time it goes down the chain it's, it's quite different this is a this is actually it is a way of living in the world it is a link of the hearts it is a set of values that mold us and that guide us to live a purposeful life and that is demonstrated through living so that's now this knowledge is not just one book the book itself is a text if we consider for thousands of years uh the it, at least in the indian, trad indian tradition uh non knowledge is primarily transmitted in the oral tradition not in the written tradition so what do we mean by this knowledge it is it is not a uh, knowledge which is frozen in texts it is embodied in people in the way they live and how do we know so 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 in principle this knowledge will be will have a dynamic element to it because it is lived at different times and how is it to be lived we cannot live say 1000 years ago the way we are living today or we cannot live 1000 years ago we could not have lived 1000 years ago the way we lived 2000 years ago so there is a core to the knowledge that is unchanging but because it is lived knowledge it is it also it also has a contextual element to it so the bhagavad gita was spoken in sanskrit earlier but now it is in english so the core message is the same but the language is different so like that it's not a so the possibility of the knowledge getting lost is there but if you understand that it's knowledge embodied through living living in a way that helps us 
attain the purpose of life attain love of god then that knowledge is not so much it's not textual precision nor is it simply a set of factual recollection and recitation or repetition it's more a way of living and having said that we can consider if we consider compare it to medicine once again that say every time when we buy a medicine from the pharmacy shop now so there is so much possibility that the medicine might get tampered along the way in india for example it is said that one out of every five or one out of 10 medicines is often a counter fake medicine so somebody else has made something similar to that the the product produced well produced medicine the the medicine from the authorized pharmaceutical production house but it looks like that it's not so now if we decide before i take a medicine i want to know whether this medicine really came from this authorized production house i want to know the full chain okay where does this medicine come from where did this medicine come from where 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 where, where? who handled it did anybody tamper with it well we could do that if we wanted to but it's it's very difficult and to oh, keep track of that is messy but for most of us how we do it is we take the medicine does it produce the desired result if yes great if not then maybe something's wrong over here so we see what was the result of the bhagavad gita's knowledge on arjuna and we'll see if today those who are living according to the bhagavad gita are having the same result so now broadly speaking the bhagavad gita is about what is the ultimate goal of life and what is the way to act so that we can achieve the ultimate goal of life there is in sanskrit is called sadhan and sadhya sadhya is what is to be achieved sadhan is what is the means to achieve it so the bhagavad gita krishna uh, after krishna gives the knowledge in the 10th chapter this chatur shloki gita which is the essence of the gita and after that arjuna expresses his understanding and arjuna declares that param brahma param dhama pavitram paramam bhavan he accepts krishna the divine as life's ultimate reality and as life's ultimate goal and then at the end of the gita he says karishe vachanam tava in 1873 he doesn't say i will fight the war he says i will do your will now i will do your will is an expression of devotion it's bhakti so basically krishna ex arjuna on hearing the gita for the original student of the gita the effect was he accepted the sadhya to be bhagwan and the sadhan to be bhakti so today we can see if those who are living according those who are teaching the gita if the result of those who are learning the gita result on those who are learning the gita is the same as what happened originally then we could say that this is is just like the medicine it had a it 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 is supposed to have a particular effect and it is having the same effect then that's a the integrity of the medicine is something which is preserved hmm. now so same way applies to spiritual knowledge it is phalena parichayati we can look at that look and look and look at some extent at the path but more importantly is the effect is the same for the result is the same then that we can say that this is uh, this is knowledge has been broadly preserved now what is sanskrit word for revelation generally it is shruti shruti is revelation smriti is recollection so smriti is also called as realization you could say broadly speaking the idea is that shruti is what enable uh, is what is revealed so the bhagavad gita is this is a technical categorization within the bhakti tradition within the vedic tradition broadly when that knowledge that clearly comes from the divine source that is called as shruti and when knowledge is composed and transmitted by the sages that is called as smriti so now the bhagavad gita is a part of the mahabharat so in that sense technically speaking it is a smriti but within that it is spoken by krishna himself and krishna is god so we could say it is a shruti within the smriti but shruti is the broad word for revelation and smriti is the word for recollection and repetition 
So now is revealed knowledge the same as realized knowledge? Not exactly. Revelation is what comes from top down. So it is it is given by the divine at a particular time in a particular uh, way uh, that is at a particular historical juncture now realization is so it is more of that which is the reality we understand it to be a reality so for example uh, scripture says that Gita later on one of the teachings is that the world is a tough place life is filled with distress now, much of the materialistic culture says, oh, there's so much enjoyment available. Just buy this, just do this, and you'll enjoy life. So now, if we experience for ourselves, if the world tells us you can attain a lot of, you earn money and you will enjoy life. But say we meet somebody who's very wealthy and then we find that they're not happy. They're having hundreds of problems in their lives. Then we say, hey, does wealth really lead to happiness? So then, oh, there's something more required for happiness. Now, this experience is a realization. So, realization means that which is a reality, we understand through our experience to be a reality. So, revelation is the description of the nature of reality as coming from a higher source. And realization is our understanding that it is a reality through our experience. So in that sense, of course, uh, realization is important. Now, can realization be had by only by devotees or even by others? It depends on what kind of realization we are talking about. The understanding that there is a non-material essence to us, that there is God, that, that there is a soul, that there is an overseeing over a, or underlying or overseeing divinity. These are foundational spiritual realizations which can be had uh, by people. In general, we could say experience and inference, which is what realization is about, that when we experience something and we infer something. So experience and infer inference can give us knowledge about the reality of God, but it cannot give us knowledge about the identity of God. What does God look like? So the specific specifics about God can do not, not specifics about spiritual reality in general. They are they can't come from inference or realization. They need to come from revelation. So there is there is a there is you can call there is rational theology and there is uh, revelational theology. Rational theology is the theology is the study of God. So then the kind of knowledge about God that can be learned through reason, that's rational theology. Revelational theology is, that is the knowledge of God, God which is learned through revelation. So the existence of God and some attributes about God we can learn, but the specifics about God's nature and personality, they can be learned through revelation, not through reason alone. So... Now, I'll just take one question and remaining questions I'll answer later. The science and spirituality question, we will be discussed. <clears throat> we will be discussing a little later. So now about faith, some people have no faith and are not able to build faith. Is that because they do not have enough Sukriti? And can faith be gained through training or is only having faith that we can get training? It's not that we can say that we don't have faith. We all have faith. It is just directed in different directions. That if suppose some, somebody has faith in every time, say, we enter a flight, we are having faith that the plane will take us to the destination. Now, with respect to faith in transcendence, yes, it requires a particular kind of disposition to have that faith. But that faith can also be developed through association. In fact, what the, uh, we all have certain impressions from the past, the past which shape us in particular ways. But more important than that is the kind of association we have. One of the biggest causes of atheism in today's world is not atheists. It is, it is theists who, who behave in reproachable ways. Who are either fanatical or hypocritical or sentimental 
and they are not rational they are not responsible uh, and they alienate people so if people can get association then that faith can be developed so there are two kinds of faith the tradition talks about the swabhava ki shraddha that is natural that means somebody has from previous lives by the practice of uh, by their spiritual or cultural practice by the spiritual impressions they have got that natural faith the other is balen utpadita balen utpadita means bala is strength utpadita is produced the idea is by the strength of the association of those who have faith that faith can be produced so there has to be some receptivity to those who are spiritually minded and the spiritually minded also need the spiritual teachers also need to be you know innovative and resourceful so that they can attract people at least to come in the association and once they come in association then the faith can be developed okay so uh, regarding how somebody who lose by the gita how does that person look like i said broadly two things as i said that they uh, they are regulated in their interactions with the world they don't get infatuated by worldly pleasures nor devastated by worldly troubles because their consciousness is not founded in matter with all its pleasure and trouble and they are they are sheltered they are strengthened they are attracted to the divine so that is when the bhagavad gita reveals the divine to be krishna so they are devoted to krishna so those are the broad characteristics these are this is a big subject which we will discuss in due course thank you very much hare krishna